Good evening, members of the Board of Education. My name is Arnie C. A.C. Dinoff, uh, District Public Advocate. And the first thing I'd like to address is, for months I've been asking for an ADA, Americans with Disabilities, um, accessible door into these boardroom. Um, we're all equipped, and we all have our faculties, and we're all healthy people, thank heavens. But as somebody that is not, or is a handicapped in a wheelchair, or has a hard time accessing our building, they can't open up their doors on their own accord to be independent. And so once again, I'd like to renew that um, um, request that we invest a few thousand dollars and make that door handicap accessible to the public. I think it's really important. Um, we asked for a flagpole for years and years and years. It took almost a decade to get that done. Hopefully, it won't take a decade to get the door ADA uh, equipped before somebody <coughs> files a complaint with the federal government or our state uh, capital. Uh, a couple issues that I'd like to address on your agenda um, are the first thing is uh, the $8.6 million at the North High School. Um, I haven't been able to review exactly what we're getting into. Uh, I sent an uh, email and staff did respond to me. Uh, evidently it wasn't laid out in the memo, but it will be a multi-purpose room and I think it's going to be a combination uh, storm shelter, but I'm not positive about that. A cafeteria addition, site improvements. And so my question is, is a lot of the supporting documents are missing. I think our facilities and construction department does a great job, but a lot of the requirements, why isn't the bid in there? Um, and why isn't the submission from all the contractors there? I think that's really important and transparent to have part of the packet. I've been involved in government for uh, decades, and I've never seen a government that doesn't disclose that or make that part of the packet, especially to the elected officials. What about the overruns uh, for construction materials? And are we having an impact at 30%? Can this project uh, wait for a while and see if we can ride the current economy? Um, also, for the uh, um, uh, contract with the crisis counselors, um, I think the only thing is, and if somebody can make that uh, clear, so we're only changing the contract from crisis counselors to social work. Or crisis counselors and social workers to mental health professionals. So it wasn't really clear in the memo. Uh, another issue, uh, the city of O'Fallon wants to offer the corner here at 511 Sodern Street to the district. It used to be the former water tower. Again, I guess we're trying to straighten out the driveway or something, that may be the intent. But uh, can we wait out the 30% the, uh, increase in uh, um, building materials? And down at West Middle School, there's a utility uh, easement request for a car wash, another car wash here in O'Fallon. And so why aren't we asking for monetary compensation? Because they're going to end up doing a lot of damage to our property. The contract says that they'll restore it to its original content. And, uh, but I think that they should pay us for it. So those are my comments, uh, Madam Chairwoman, or Madam President. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next we have Katie Stiffen. Uh, I 
came here tonight for help as a Fort Small teacher and as a parent. I'm a teacher and a parent of three in the district. The district's policies on discipline need to be followed and the amount of disrespect and the negative behaviors that are tolerated in our schools is unacceptable. I'm lucky to have amazing students, but unfortunately the students who misbehave are taking up all of my time as a teacher. The disrespect, the lack of control and the cell phones has made my job nearly impossible. My days are filled with correcting behaviors of a few students over and over and over again. Then the majority of students who are the good students who are following the rules are not getting the attention or the education that they deserve. I don't know how to fix this, but I know we need help as a parent and as a teacher. I should be able to go to work and teach the children in my class and um, my students and my children should be able to come to school to learn. I shouldn't have to fear for my safety and the safety of my students, but we do on a daily basis. Behaviors are so out of control. The dress code policy isn't enforced. My two older children will not even go to the bathroom because of vaping and drug use going on in the bathrooms. The fights that are happening at school are becoming more and more violent, which I have experienced firsthand. As a teacher, I cannot compete with the cell phones. The students' grades in our health classes are lower than they have ever been. We are not helping the kids. I feel like we are enabling the bad behaviors and the other kids are so desensitized to it that they don't even bat an eye at it anymore. I don't wanna complain. I wanna be a part of <coughs> fixing our schools. I love Fort Zumwalt and I'm so sad to see what our schools have become. I moved to this area for the schools. I don't know if that was the right choice now. As a parent and as a teacher, I'm asking for help from the school board to make our schools better and a place where everyone can learn, grow, and be safe. I don't have the solutions, but I'd like to be a part of it. Thank you. audience. I have three children that go to elementary school within the district. Each of my children have witnessed behaviors that include flipping desks, throwing chairs at school supplies, screaming and stomping in anger while others are trying to learn, and physical violence which combines it with these behaviors and results with the remainder of the students having to leave the classroom. These events are not isolated. They happen regularly and one of my children was on the receiving end of an instance of this kind of physical violence. In addition to this violence, which ha uh, it's what's really disturbing to me are the questions my children ask regarding what happens to the students who exhibit this behavior. For example, uh, why does it seem like the student doesn't get in trouble? Why does the student get to have candy or toys in the classroom while everyone else is trying to learn and be distracting? Why does the student get picked for special jobs or get their favorite toy or game in indoor recess more often than everybody else? And why does the student still display poor behavior when they have all of that fun stuff? Students realize that there are either different sets of rules or different ways in which the rules are applied in these instances, and that can be troubling to them. I realize the district must accommodate each student's education plan. However, I believe that the current system of management of these behaviors is not working with accommodations that are distracting to majority of the class and are detrimental to each student's learning and development. I acknowledge that the district administrators and teachers are limited on how they can accommodate each student's needs as it pertains to management of these behaviors. Likely due to budget constraints, however, if, uh, I, I understand that, if, that you're, you're hamstrung on that. But however, if more parents were aware of this major issue facing our schools, I believe they'd be more willing support budget increases to help alleviate the strain on, of the, on the classrooms that result from dealing with these behaviors. I implore you to create an environment where teachers can discuss these issues with administration and you without fear of retaliation for the concerns they have. Please reach out to the teachers who are all on the front line of this. And finally, please help educate your constituency based on what you learn from the teachers and not ignore the importance of providing the most effective learning environment for each student which may not look the same from one to the next. Thank you. Good 
evening. Um, I just wanted to first thank the board for their support last year of the Fort Zubalt West High School Robotics team. Um, I know you will be considering our request to again travel to the National BattleBots competition and we request your support for that. Um, to be respectful of your time, I'm representing a group of parents. We also have quite a few parents that are currently at the state competition right now, so they can't be here, but we do want to appreciate your support of the program and the coach, um, Mr. Fitzpatrick, and we also want to let you know that we appreciate everything that you did last year. We would also ask that as soon as it's possible for the board, I know your schedules are tight, we would love to have you come and see what the kids are doing in the shop. I think that would really be um, impressive to you. It, it certainly is to me. Um, we are seeking approval for travel to the national tournament, which is next weekend in <coughs> Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Last year, the team placed 10th out of the country. We expect the field to be a little more competitive this year with more teams returning from COVID, but we're hoping to make a strong uh, showing again this year. And as I did for the regional competition about a month ago, I will send you the link so that you can live stream those matches. So thank you very much. We do want to recognize all the time and hard work that Mr. Fitzpatrick puts in. Without his dedication, the team just would not be able to be where it is. And our goal as parents is not only to have a team for our kids this year, but also to have a team that will still be in place for, for kids 10, 15, 20 years from now. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for your time. Um, I am one of the voices of the parents um, with regards to uh, the environment lately that I've been hearing from my son and just uh, in general. So um, as parents, what we can do to help foster, uh, what can we do to help foster a safe and learning environment? School focus should be to learn, grow minds, but lately it seems like the energy is focused on situations of aggressive behavior and warding away unhealthy habits. In the, in the past few months, I've known, I've known of two fights, both at the high school and the middle school, um, that have resulted in uh, injury both to students and to teachers. Uh, I've heard of instances from my own son during passing time at the middle school uh, where he has experienced vaping, including marijuana, uh, on campus. Uh, on, on school buses, the use of profanity uh, is, uh, is extreme and there's no regard to action, it seems like, from the school. And the question I have is for parents, teachers, for me as a parent, as teachers and administration, is how can we ensure students are not, to ensure students that are not abiding by rules and laws are held accountable for these actions? In my own workplace, fighting, vaping, profanity, it's just not acceptable. Um, and uh, I just feel like these same expectations um, it should be asked upon from our own school system to keep our kids safe. Um, I am asking for us all, so me as a parent, you as school board members, teachers, um, for us all to foster change. I mean, we just need the change. We expect this in our homes, I expect it in our work, and obviously we expect it in our school systems. My intent today is not to um, be uh, pointing fingers, but to open up the conversation between parents, between school board, between teachers, um, to try to foster more positive behavior, pushing for positive peer influence. That's what we're for. Um, I used to praise uh, at Fort Zumwalt District. I mean, I came from a private school and we moved because we wanted the, the better education. And it's, it's a little difficult right now to continue that praise. So what I ask for you is, is, is that desire to change, for that change. Um, I'm asking for your help, uh, your guidance. What can we do? I'm willing to help and I want to see that change, and obviously there's other parents and teachers that want that change. So thank you for your time. I know it's, you are very busy, so thank you. Evening. I want to 
First, uh, I'll let you guys know, thank you guys for your continued support of the Fort Jumal Robotics Program. I'm speaking on behalf of some of the parents there as well. Uh, the program has been a lot to a lot of the kids that aren't in sports or in band or in other things. I've seen a lot of kids grow in the program in the three years that I've been there with my son. Um, we thank you for your past, your present, for your future support. Hopefully we have that going for nationals, I think. Um, watching them on the YouTube, watching them live is extremely wonderful. Watching the kids get all excited about splitting the bot in half is quite entertaining. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the program, say thank you for the support, thank you from all the parents, thank you from the kids, and thank you for the teacher support. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Teresa Davis and I'm a parent of two elementary age children and a substitute for the school district. I spend most of my time in the elementary schools and I'm here tonight to voice concerns regarding the elimination of PE minutes at the elementary level along with the disruptive behavior in the classrooms. Um, I believe these two issues go hand in hand. First off, I along with other parents were upset to hear that the district decided to remove 20 minutes of weekly PE time. Neither parents, parents nor staff were consulted about the change. I understand that this change was made um, to keep special times consistent and while I can appreciate the need for consistency, perhaps eliminating opportunities for kids to engage in physical play in place of more technology and library was not the right choice. More technology and library is more expected sitting and being on computers. Most kids get ample, ample time sitting on screens, but many do not have access to sports teams or other like activities for various reasons. These kids are already crawling the walls, causing disruptions throughout the day as the expectations to sit for extended periods of time is placed on their shoulders. I've seen kids destroy classrooms, and one of the first strategies when working through these problems with these kids is exercise. Staff allow them the opportunity to blow off steam by using various exercises and weighted equipment. This is a safer way to get out any aggression that they, these kids may be feeling. They get the opportunity to engage in physical activity because it's known to help when they're experiencing a crisis. There are many studies that show when a person is suffering from mental health problems, increasing exercise is one of the first strategies used to help. It should be common sense to increase physical activity in order to help with the mental health crisis many kids are experiencing. Our district seems to be making mental health a priority. Perhaps our district would see a decrease in negative behaviors if these kids had ample time to move around, play, and be kids. We are the only school district moving backwards when it comes to physical education in the elementary schools. Many school districts have increased PE and recess, yet we are choosing not to make that a priority. I've spoken with many teachers who have um, also expressed concerns for their students. They've told me that these kids don't know how to problem solve, have conversations, or play games together. These are basic life skills, and these kids need help. COVID really set us back in the areas of social emotional development. These kids need time to be active, learn to win and lose, and work through problems, and PE is a great place for that type of lesson. Many organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend 60 minutes of daily exercise. So many kids go home from school and play video games and consume media. School is a great place to get these kids together without electronics distracting them. Taking away physical education and music and adding library and technology time to their schedule does not seem to be what's best for kids. They get plenty of screen time throughout the school day and after. Many kids thrive in music and PDE and need time to move and be creative. This issue is one where every child could benefit from more activity in their lives. Please consider adding the 20 minutes of PE back to the elementary schedule and even consider adding more time for PE next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Um, only item of recognition tonight is a special thing we're starting this year for the first time. Um, we are doing our recognition of academic all stars for the class of 2023. So tonight we have 13 members of that class who will join us for special recognition from the board before their graduation ceremonies. In planning for this recognition, this group has become known as our academic all-stars. Some of them earned recognition and maybe more importantly money for college through the National Merit Scholarship Competition. Others earned recognition as part of the Missouri Scholars 100. Um, in some cases, students who are here tonight earned both of those honors. Uh, so what we'd like to do is Dr. Dreyer is going to come up for us, tell us a little bit more about each of those recognitions, and then each of the schools is going to introduce their recipients tonight. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening, board members. On behalf of all the high school principals, I'd like to congratulate each of these students who are not only some of the best and brightest students in the Fort Dumont School District, but some of the best and brightest throughout the entire state of Missouri. National Merit Scholars were among one million students nationwide to take the standardized test known as the Preliminary SAT or the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test in the fall of their junior year. As finalists, our National Merit Scholars are among the top scorers in the nation and in the top 1% of individuals who took this exam nationwide. Out of the 1 million students to take this exam, only 8,000 nationwide earned the honor of being a National Merit Scholar. Missouri Scholar 100 students have been recognized for their work throughout the high school, excuse me, throughout their high school careers, competing in what's known as an academic decathlon. To meet the decathlon requirements, <coughs> a student must have a minimum GPA of a 3.75, a minimum ACT score of 29, or a minimum SAT score of 1600, be ranked in the top 10% of their class, and have taken upper level courses in math, science, English, and foreign language. They must also have excellent attendance, be a great school citizen, and be involved within their high school. Now, after all that, they're just considered for the Missouri Scholars 100. At the end of the day, only 100 seniors throughout the state of Missouri are recognized for this honor. Now, I have two West High students I'd like to recognize tonight. Uh, Pranav Palaniapin could not be here. He was a Missouri Scholars 100. And I'd like to introduce Ava Baker. Come on up, Ava. And as you hear kind of the theme tonight, Ava is a National Merit Scholar and a Missouri 100 Scholar. Congratulations to Ava. Okay. Are we taking a picture or am I introducing Ms. Golden? Can we uh, have Dr. Vaughn come up next? Oh, Mrs. Golden is next. Oh, I'm sorry. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Ms. Stephanie Golner, who's representing Fort Dumont South High School. Good evening, board members. We had, at South High, we had four National Merit Scholars. So I'm going to announce them first, and then we had two Missouri 100. So the first one is Seth Vick Entry. <laughs> Next we have Hayden Reinhold. Varun Vassaretti. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my best on this one. <laughs> Raja Lakshmi Yarlagada. And our Missouri Top 100 Scholars are Chavi Khanna. and Megana Sivabalan. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ashley Vaughn from East High. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, I honestly am so proud to be able to recognize these two students um, and have them be recognized out of the class of 2023. Uh, for not just because they are genuinely like rock stars in the classroom, we're talking top 25, East Elite, um, but they're also two, two varsity sport athletes. And I tried to memorize all of the clubs that they're in to recite them for you tonight, I just couldn't, because genuinely they are involved in every aspect of the East High community. They did high school right. And so I am so proud to, to be honoring them tonight. Our um, Missouri Scholars 100 was Camille Dutt. And our National Merit Scholar was Andrew Huddy. Congratulations, sir. Up next is Dr. Entwistle. Good evening. I get to introduce you to three amazing Panthers, um, like Dr. Vaughn had spoke. These are students who are involved in multiple um, areas in our school, help lead, help make the decisions that are moving us forward, and they are going to be the ones that move us forward as they go tackle the world. So keep an eye on these, these three. First, I'd like to introduce you to Elise Davis. She's one of our 
Missouri Top 100 Scholars. She's going to go on to University of s &T. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Hope Wheeler. Hope Wheeler was a national merit finalist. She's going to be going to the University of Central Florida. And then Alan Meyer. Alan Meyer was a Top 100 Scholar and a national merit University of Tulsa. Thank you. Guys, if I can get you together with your principals and we'll get a picture here in front of the board, in front of the podium. I trust all of you to find a window in front of the podium for me, Dr. Antlis. Front of the podium. I want to see his kit. There we go. Okay, Sal, bring it in. Bring it in. Where did Ava go? Congratulations on your accomplishments and your graduation from high school. <laughs> Next, we have our consent agenda. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda and present it in front of you. Judge Marion, second. Mr. George. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any opposed? Good evening, members of the board. I direct your attention to the monthly financial summary, help pull together all the numbers for this month and through the year. Cash and investments for the month of April totaled at the end of the month $168,129,325.15. Operating funds, which are for the teacher and the general funds, totaled 85.2 million. Food service, 6.5. Student activities, 2.9. Bond funds, 55.2. And debt service was 18.3. Of that was 175.6 million invested April 30th. And I would like to point out, you'll note that the investments are more than our cash balances, and that's because we don't release those payments. The money's sitting out there until you guys approve the bills tonight, and then those checks will go out tomorrow. Um, monthly revenues. For the month of April, total $12,626,159.95, as shown on the revenue report. For the month of April, revenues from local sources were $5.5 million, state $5.6, and federal $1.1. In total, our revenues are running about $11.9 million more than last year at the same time, year to date. This was mainly due to several items down below, as you see them outlined there, $7 million more from local property taxes are... Sus values came in much higher at time of billing than, than they were when they, we set the levy, so that's a large part of why that was larger. Um, 1.1 million was in Prop C sales tax, 1.1 million more in in lieu of, and um, part of that's just timing. We will, because last year we got that a little bit later than we did this year, but 423,000 was new money. We, in lieu of taxes, whenever uh, the cities have a tax abatement, they'll have properties and they will pay, typically it's around 50% of what we would normally get, but they do that to help spur the economy, and they do that because some of those areas are blighted or whatever. So um, that's where that came from. $2.6 million more in interest earnings, which of course makes sense based on where the interest rates are today. $4.2 million in transportation funding. As you know, the state fully funded the transportation formula this year, first time in my entire career. And luckily, I think they've already said they're going to do it again next year. So go state. Woohoo. Um, that's awesome. 372,000 more in high needs funding, 737 more stimulus funding. Some of the negatives were about a million less in that food, food service revenue. Last year, you may recall that the federal government fully funded all meals for all students, regardless of free or reduced status. It didn't matter. They paid for them all, and it was at a high reimbursement rate. That went away this this year, so that's why that is a decrease there. And 4.5 million less in early childhood, and that's just the timing of, of uh, payment as well. We had to work with our for to get our final expenditure report approved by the state, and they finally approved that. So we'll be getting a, a very large payment coming up this month. 
Expenses for the month of April totaled nineteen million three hundred seventy one thousand five hundred fifty nine dollars and nineteen cents, and this is pretty typical for the for the month of April. Um, salaries totaled to twelve point one million. Benefits four point three. Purchase services point nine. One point one million for supplies and point nine on capital projects. Um, for the year, expenses are up by fourteen point six million. The bulk of that increase was due to us, uh, which is part of our debt schedule. 4.8 million more in scheduled principal and interest payments, and 4.6 million more on bond finance, construction, and capital spending. And you guys are aware of that, all the capital projects we have going on and the bond funds that we sold those bonds last year. This leaves 5.2 million of the increase is related to operations. 3 million was related to salaries and is in line with what we would expect to see based on staffing and wage changes throughout the, between last year and this year. Um, as we discussed in previous reports, purchase service costs and supplies are also up this year. Purchase service costs are up year to date by 1.2 million. That's primarily from contract transportation for special ed students and out of district placements, and partially because um, we had some increases in PD, student activities, and just some other professional fees. Support costs, uh, supply costs are higher year to date by 1 million. That's, we've talked about this in the past. A lot of that is directed at student activities. Bus parts are really going up as far as trying to do our repair parts for all our buses. We have a 172, 175 bus fleet, so it takes a lot of parts to keep them running. Custodial supplies and usage is up for the year, as well as um, some purchase of some curriculum books and materials. So I'm not sure if anybody has any questions or anything I presented or any of the other financial reports, but I'd happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions? Right. I'm not any motion to approve excuse me, the financial reports presented by Mr. Orr. Mr. Helm second. Mr. Christopher, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. <coughs> Thank you. First item under old business is facility planning. Lisa Kessler is going to go over North High School building edition and the details of uh, what are any updates. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Members of the board, in your packet was a memo to Dr. Myers. Uh, we had bid out the North High School building edition, which consisted of uh, the cafeteria edition and then the storm shelter slash multi-purpose room, and then some miscellaneous interior renovations. <coughs> we had asked for several alternates just to give us some flexibility on our in our bids, um, and we went through those. We did receive bids from four contractors. And then based on the bid results that I have attached, I'd like to recommend awarding a contract to integrate construction partners for the, for the base bid. And then alternate four, which is to add some new light fixtures to the existing cafeteria area. That way it would be all cohesive between the new addition and the existing. And then alternate number six, which again is to add light fixtures to just the serving area. So we just get that whole area, once we're building a new cafeteria, to all look very nice and cohesive. So if we would award all of those three, the total contract amount would be $8,582,856. Um, Integrate Construction is a new contract we've never worked with, but we did do some um, interviews with them. We called uh, some re recommendations that they had, and I also called some of their subcontractors that, we've worked, that they've worked with. Got very good reviews from all of them. They were very impressive at their interview, very organized. Um, I can't say anything bad about them. I couldn't. I mean, they seemed like they were on it, and they're excited to do a job for us. So, um, with your permission, I'd like to ask for a recommendation to award a contract to them. Thank you again. Um, we did bid out some concrete improvements at our baseball fields, uh, South High and North High. We felt needed some improvements made. Um, so at South High, we're going to be adding some, um, replacing asphalt with concrete. We're adding in some additional drainage system. We tend to have a problem there with the baseball field getting really wet and causing some cancellations in their games. So we're adding a lot of infrastructure there besides the concrete to help take care of that problem. 
And then at North High, we're also adding some concrete around their dugouts and, and sidewalks just so they're not walking grass and we have a place to put the bleachers. Um, we received four bids on that and Karen Brock Construction was the low bidder. Uh, so it was the base bid to do all the concrete infrastructure and then an alternate number one at South High to add a concrete swale. There's a retention basin in there that gets really mucky and we want to kind of clean it up. It, it keeps eroding the ground in there. So if we put a concrete swale, that should take care of the problem. Um, but I'd like to ask for uh, permission to uh, award a contract to Karen Brock for $266,000 and uh, they have done a substantial amount of work for the district and always do a good job. tonight the first is the middle school um, ELA curriculum so Mrs. Kenny Holloway is going to come up and kind of start that process um, and she brought along a few friends who are on the writing team with her um, they have rewritten our curriculum made sure it's aligned <laughs> uh, and also chosen some materials so they have a PowerPoint and they're going to walk us through that I know that you have access, of course, to the slideshow as well as the ELA curriculum guide. Um, I am Candy Holloway, the secondary ELA curriculum coordinator, and with me this evening is Kathy Redliff, who teaches seventh grade at South Middle School, and Laura Walsh, who teaches eighth grade at West Middle. We are eager to be here tonight just to kind of share with you the work that has taken place uh, this year during our ELA um, curriculum study for middle school. Our goal this evening is to share with you the process that we engaged in, also to share with you the revisions that were made to the ELA curriculum guide and recommendations that we have moving forward. To begin with, um, I wanted to make sure that you understood that the curriculum study committee consisted of several ELA teachers. We had 15 teachers across the district representing four buildings. These teachers were selected by um, building administrators and department chairs. And we had a really a wide range of experience. We had teachers who were teaching in co-taught classrooms, we had new <coughs> teachers, and we had veteran teachers. So lots of voices at the table to help us with this process. We actually began taking a closer look at our curriculum study in 2022 during the spring by conducting a, a need survey. We really wanted the teachers to take a close look at the curriculum as it stood and identify certain curricular needs, needs that would help us actually improve student achievement. And based on that need survey, they identified these areas. They said that we needed additional novels, a resource that would provide additional text, as well as progress monitoring, so that we would be able to put in place multi-tiered systems of support, a resource that would help us meet the listening standards, as well as a writing resource. So with those needs in mind, we really started taking a close look at our data in the, in the summer. We looked at our map data based on the past two years, as well as our Galileo benchmarks. And what we did is we spent time really examining that data in a variety of perspectives. We even took a look at our item analysis, as well as trends. And we identified strengths, as well as areas that we knew that we needed more explicit instruction and help, all right? So, Using the data, then we conducted a curriculum audit. So taking a close look at everything that we currently had in place. So that was the process that we went through, it was kind of twofold. And then of course we went um, and started working on the novel study, one of the biggest needs that was identified by teachers. And I want to kind of give you a, 
a, a broad perspective of what that novel study um, included. <coughs> like, we literally met nine times. Um, we actually read and evaluated more than 80 novels. And we used a text complexity rubric that is um, provided by DESI. When we read each novel, we took into consideration the following, the themes and how well it would fit into our curriculum with our current themes and essential questions. We also took a look at the craft and structure, the language features, the knowledge demands, as well as the standards. We also sought input from librarians, giving us an idea of student appeal and their interest. And we also used feedback that we've received from parents over the past few years. And some of the parents have expressed a desire for more choice, more representation, positive messages, and positive role models. So those are some things that we took into consideration every single time we read a novel. And Kathy's going to walk you through our curriculum writing process, because she's super excited about all the work she's done. <laughs> Okay, so using the data that Candy was talking about, um, the ELT, ELA curriculum writing team met 10 times throughout the year. Um, we would spend a day together um, and to revise the curriculum to go through what we needed to add and look at what we already had. We sought input, though, from back at our own schools, from each building, from our CLT and our colleagues. So what we did is we broke down each unit and we mapped them around essential questions. And we made sure that we included all four ELA strands, which are literature, informational text, writing, and speaking and listening. We made sure that we incorporated a variety of research-based instructional strategies, as well as created and revised assessments to mirror map type assessments. So in your slides, if you click on the ELA curriculum at the top, that goes to the ELA curriculum guide. And so I'm just gonna kind of quickly give you an overview of uh, the table of contents, which is on slide two. So in the ELA curriculum guide, uh, we revised sections three, four, and five, which included our philosophy for ELA grades six through eight, course descriptions, rationales, and objectives, which we made sure that they reflect the Missouri language arts grade level expectations. We added a year at a glance for each grade level that demonstrate backwards design with performance tasks and essential questions. And then sections six and seven um, include more detailed information, a little bit about what Candy was speaking about, about our novel study and our committees and rationales for each of the novels that we chose. And if you will take a close look at section seven that includes the novel rationales, because as we were revising curriculum, we were continuing to have those novel uh, conversations, and I'm sorry that is yeah. very difficult to read. Um, but I know that you have it in front of you, right? So when you take a look at that, after we had made revisions to our curriculum, the teachers then came together and we narrowed the list. So remember, we were reading between like 80 to 90 novels, and we narrowed that list to 10 per grade level. Um, and we, again, we were taking a closer look at that text complexity score, how well those titles would fit within our curriculum needs, and as well as taking a look at student representation. And so what you'll notice when you're looking at your slide, the novels that are on the left-hand side are those that are already board approved. The novels on the right-hand side are the ones that we are recommending to the board this evening. Those um, novels, uh, again, were really taken like a close look at, and if you look at your rationales, and I know that they're pretty lengthy, right? Because we included a summary, we talked about the themes that are focused on, we talked to you about the standards that can be addressed when utilizing those novels. We also were very transparent. There were some things in certain books that were touched upon and we wanted to be very open and honest about those. But one of the things that we're really proud of is that this will allow us to um, give students more choice. There's more representation in terms of diversity of characters. And the other thing that we're happy with is that if there are any um, student or parent concerns, it will really allow teachers to supplement novels in and out they can be interchangeable. And this really gives us uh, a broader way to actually meet the needs of all of our kids, okay? So you have those for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. And while we were working on curriculum writing and while we were working on the novel study, we were also piloting certain digital resources that Laura's gonna talk to you about. So throughout this school year, 
we piloted five different digital resources. Actively Learn, News ELA, and Common Lit provide a range and volume of both literature and informational texts. <laughs> ListenWise addressed our speaking and listening standards. And Writable is a digital literacy platform that addresses and allows us to scaffold writing skills. Each um, of these resources was piloted for two months, and then we evaluated them using a scoring guide. Uh, we examined each resource for the following. Range and volume of text, accessibility and access for all learners, standards alignment, range of questions and um, enrichment opportunities, customization, and how well they integrated with Canvas. After piloting <coughs> these platforms, Teachers voted to adopt and are recommending the following digital resources, Common Lit, ListenWise, and Writable. Rather than purchasing a textbook, these digital platforms will serve as our primary resources. They provide translations, transcripts, audios, and a variety of things to meet our students' diverse <coughs> needs. Common Lit um, has that variety of informational and fictional text. Uh, it has a beginning of the year diagnostic assessment teachers can use and allows for progress monitoring of our standards throughout the year. It'll allow student teachers to respond to student needs and provides a variety of instructional strategies. ListenWise and Writable enhance our curriculum and meet student needs in both the speaking and listening strands and writing. Um, they help, they are data focused and are student centered. And additionally, ListenWise and Writable both also um, can benefit other content areas like science and social studies. So after thoughtful consideration, we are recommending the following. We would like to be able to add those three digital resources, uh, Common Lit, ListenWise, and Writable. We are hoping that we uh, are able to get those novels that we have suggested approved. But the other piece that we haven't mentioned yet is we'd like to be able to purchase patterns of power for each teacher. It really <laughs> focuses on the very explicit and syst uh, systematic instruction grammar. It is based on the science of reading, and it will allow us to really continue the work that's being done K-5. So that's our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> So detailed, so helpful, um, so transparent for the board to know what they're voting for. Um, I really appreciate it. I know that had to take an incredible amount of time. And, um, so I just want to commend you on all of it, but especially that because I know that had to be quite tumultuous. So thank you for that. I wanted to add, I'm really excited about the show me a sign in that perspective. Really excited to see that in sixth grade. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, Dr. Amy Sand along with um, a couple of her high school teachers from her writing team. They are actually presenting high school core courses and uh, our AP courses as well. So they will do electives next year. So this is, um, and Amy will tell you what I'm looking at, but it's Algebra, Geometry, Algebra 2, and our AP coursework as well. So I will turn it over to Amy. So good evening, some of you. I saw you about this time last year when we brought middle school math, and I told you I'd be back, and I am, and I brought some friends with me. Um, so thank you for your time. We will keep it short, because I know you've got a packed agenda. Um, and I'm going to say you'll probably hear a lot of the same things that you heard from Candy. Her office is right next to mine, and she likes to steal my work, so she, uh, <laughs> you know, no, I'm just kidding. We, we do work collaboratively in the curriculum office, so we do use a lot of the same processes and have, um, you know, conversations, so you will hear a lot of the same things in our presentation that you heard from Candy. So, my friends with me today are Doug Steinmeier from South High and Kelly Palmer from East High. 
Um, they're just two people who put in a lot of work on our math, high school math curriculum. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our goals, um, and they're going to jump in on our processes and kind of some of the pieces that we're, um, that we're recommending to add to our toolbox for high school math. So as I said last year, when Heather and I came with our K-8 math curriculum, our goal was really to build coherence in K-8, and the same is true for high school, building that bridge from eighth grade to high school. And we have data that shows that we're doing well with our core math curriculum. We're, we're top in the county in Algebra mm -hmm. 1. We're really strong in the state also. So, but we don't want to rest on that. We want to make sure that we keep pushing ourselves and that we're looking for places that we aren't necessarily needing the mark. And for us, that kind of falls on some of our student groups and students who may not necessarily be on traditional pathways. So um, our goal was really to not only build on our successes, but find places where we can make our curriculum stronger in our algebra geometry algebra pathway as well as AP um, so that's uh, that those were our goals of our curriculum committee and here's our team quite a big team we had to break our work off into uh, a couple of groups because obviously pulling all of these teachers out at one time on one day was problematic um, so um, we pieced it together and we met about the same number of times as ELA did. Some groups met more often. Um, AP Stats and AP Calc didn't meet as often because their, their curriculum really comes from College Board, so it's, it's pretty set. They had a little less to do in terms of creating. Um, so that's our team. Also represents every building in the district. So we've got diversity. We have um, we have equity in our writing teams, and it really showed in the room. Um, we, we got into some really deep discussions some days, and that's good. I think that uh, that shows that we are really passionate about our work and that we're representing all of our kids. Uh, so I'm going to have Doug and Kelly talk about our process, or the, because the way I see it doesn't always um, it's not always the same as the teachers when they're doing the work, so I'm going to have Doug go first. Doug's representing kind of the AP side of things. He's also talking for AP Computer Science because we're bringing that to you also. Um, we just decided to piggyback them on with each other, so um, I'm going to let Doug talk. Um, so the, the AP curriculums, uh, like, like Amy said, um, are very much built out by College Board. So on our end, it's a matter of what those groups did is more went into the details because College Board gave us the big ideas, what the expectation is on the college level. Um, and so all of our teachers went into the details and also choosing resources that we thought would help us better prepare our kids or prepare our kids for those, those AP tests. Um, if you guys look at the, the AP data that, that we have, we're, we're doing quite well in, in all three that we're talking about here with, with AP statistics and AP calculuses. All four schools are uh, always consistently hitting that out of the park. And then also the AP computer science, uh, which we're trying to grow. That's one that we're really trying to grow, and, and it's, I have the largest class that I've had in the eight or nine years that we've, that we've uh, had this class. But those groups really focused on, like I said, mostly on um, choosing a resource and really getting into the details so that when we uh, things turn over and we have new people coming in, uh, those, those new teachers can, can jump right in and know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. So. And I'm kind of the other end of the spectrum. I was one of the writers for Math 9. Um, and I'm also a SPED teacher. So I kind of brought in the perspective of our at-risk population. Um, and I did come up from the middle school. So a lot of like, and wrote last year. So I brought that perspective in while we were doing Math 9. Um, and then helping with the Algebra Geometry and Algebra 2 mindset. Um, through the whole process, we were first revisiting what we had, sifting through that, figuring out what best practices we had, and then keeping that and then aligning to what's next, what's best. Um, one of the biggest things that we're really 
hoping to push forward with is our multi-tiered systems of support. We have a new assessment tool that we want to propose for you all to see or to understand a little bit more about that will be able to open up so many options for so many more of our students. It will give us uh, ways to differentiate. It will give us ways to assess those kids. It will be able to group them more appropriately to support these kids at different levels. Um, and it's something that every class, everywhere from our AP class all the way down to our Math 9, we're going to be able to use as a resource. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it started with an audit and then we evaluated our curriculum resource choices. We went down from 10 to 2 and they piloted the two choices for pretty much all of second semester. We had our reps come in a couple of times uh, to meet with teachers, um, give various supports, answer questions. So the recommendations that we're bringing to you tonight for Algebra, algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2, um, basically we're uh, asking for curriculum resources in the form of digital textbooks, um, which is not really any different than what we've asked for in the past. Um, and the technology piece, uh, graphing calculators, we've had those in our classrooms for uh, since I've been here, which is now seven years. We just need them updated because they are kind of old, they are not holding their charges, so we just need to refresh that. So as Kelly mentioned, the new piece to this that we, are, we would like to add is that assessment platform that will allow us to figure out what students know, what they need, to know how we can address those needs, provide that multi-system, multi-tiered system of support where teachers can address individual kids' needs a lot easier and quicker. So we're not just giving blanket assessment or uh, assignments out to multiple kids that isn't really relevant to them. I know Gabriel, last year you asked me about homework and will it cut down on homework? I see this assessment platform as really lasering in on, instead of me giving 50 problems to all my kids, I can give the 10 that this kid needs and the five that this kid needs. And they can do that with this platform a lot faster and a lot better and more efficient and it's gonna help everybody in that process. So, questions? I mean, to, to go with that, the response to intervention is a labor-intensive process mm -hmm. that, that this Delta Math Integral will, will definitely make much, much uh, more efficient for us in the classroom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah. Um, do you guys have offer, or is there a class that bases basic statistics? So that will be on our agenda for next year, so you'll see me again next year. <laughs> so right now we do have AP stats, but uh, for the last couple of years we've recognized that our electives are kind of outdated because we have the traditional college algebra, pre-calculus, which most of us probably recognize from our own high school experience. We have AP stats, but we do need to offer some electives that are more relevant for this current generation and where they're going. So a basic stats is one of the options or something that's more like a financial algebra class. That's something that is, uh, I'm seeing other districts um, add to their electives. So that actually is on my agenda for my IAC tomorrow is what are we going to add so that we can start that work in August. So that's the next piece to this. We've started from the bottom and we're moving up. Awesome, if I could throw another math in there, yeah. trigonometry. So we do have some trigonometry built into our pre-calc class and just a little bit is in our geometry class. It's just basic trig. You'll find more in our in our pre-calc class than you and some in college algebra. I have like back in the day when I was a Fortune Wall student, it was a standalone semester class. So that is one of the options we've talked about too, is offering a trigonometry class as a semester elective if we can find something to piggyback and offer as the, the second semester with it. Have, having it though, like combined with pre-calc, instead of having a year and a half of math the kids have to take, uh, as, as a lot of us did to be able to get to that next level, you only need pre-calc that includes that, that trigonometry in it. Thank you. 
All in favor say aye. Next item, Jeff Moore has prepared the 2022-23 budget modifications. And it's going to go over how many <laughs> so you've you've had this budget modification in your electronically so you've had a chance to review it you have a hard copy here just for hands on if you want to so take a look at this I, I'm going to start by just saying that there are five required parts of a budget by law and that's the budget message which is the the narrative piece that describes the summary of changes between this budget and the previous budget it also includes the tax rate and assessed valuation in, in, in under that tab. And then you have to have the fund balance section, revenues, expenses, and outstanding debt. So if you can see our fund balances, there's different tabs for each. The revenues go through by where the, where the money comes from, local, state, county. Then, of course, the details there and expenditures are displayed in here by object which is kind of what they are salaries benefits purchase services and then the second section of of the actual expenses is by function which is kind of what they're for like elementary instruction middle school instruction so it's kind of broken down expenses two different ways um, for the most part i i usually direct your attention and i'm going to do so tonight to the budget message which kind of is the narrative and kind of it, the meat and potatoes of it there's also a variance page which is page five in here and that kind of describes just what the different changes were between the december budget and this budget revision so i'll go through a, a, a brief summary here um, right now our revised budget is projecting a total ending fund balance of 75.5 million for all funds and an operating fund balance of 48.2 million or 20.9 percent this is a vast improvement over where it had been just a couple of years ago. Um, and this is largely due to one time or what I would call temporary funding. We've, we've been fortunate to get some stimulus funding um, based on, on from the federal government. The, some one time funding right now in this budget is $4.8 million, which I consider one time. And then we have another 5 million for state transportation, state, state transportation funding by full funding that gave us that extra five. We typically get about $2 million and we're getting a little over seven. Um, I do have to point out though that Desi's already told us, we have been able to keep our ADA a little bit higher. We saw a pretty decent decline in our ADA when COVID hit and we have not seen that cliff yet. ADA is our average daily attendance. So basically each kid is worth one if they show up every day and they have perfect attendance but ours usually it's been running sub 90 and i know for um, state purposes they want it to be at least what 94 percent and so that's we used to be above that and it's starting to come back a little bit but because our attendance was hit because of the absences from covid they've allowed us to claim we're still claiming based on our 2021 i believe 88 and right now it's a probably at least 100 less than that so that's about six million dollars in, in value of those hundred kids so that's it's a big it's going to be a big hit when that and that won't be next year but it'll be the year after whenever they've already told us that we'll go back to doing it the old way so unless we start to see an in, increase in our student body i don't i don't believe that's the case it's been a slow trend down as it is um, we just kind of took a, a a big drop there when COVID hit and we're not sure really what happened to those kids they just we lost them that's they went somewhere else so um as far as revenues are concerned this total budget is projected to have 280.8 million in this budget this is an increase of 6.1 million for all funds and this was caused by as i talked about a little bit in my my uh, uh financial report we had an increase in our current taxes increase in the interest rates um, increase in some of our state revenues and increase in federal food food service that was just really a shift net we're down a million in food service but overall we had a shift from the federal since they had the kids had to start paying their fair share of it full kids full price kids had to start paying for meals again and uh, reduced price we had to start pulling that in from them as well um, as far as the um, property taxes those went up about 1.4 million interest earnings 1.6 
At the state level, we had an increase of 487,000 for basic formula, and early childhood special ed went up 423,000. Um, that's really just a function of carried over from the prior year. Our current year, or this current year's revenues are based on prior year expenses for early childhood since it's reimbursed. Um, and finally, at the federal level, food service reimbursements, like I said, went up about 1.6 million. And then Medicaid claiming revenues also went up 358,000 this year. And when we look at operating funds in this budget, it's projecting a total of, um, for operating revenue, 241.7 million and the teacher and general funds only, and that is an increase of 3.9 million over the December revised budget. Total expenses in the May revised budget are projected to be 327.1 million. This includes 61.9 million of, of money that came over from bonds. We sold those bonds at the end of last year. That became a balance on our capital projects fund. It's important to note because that doesn't mean that our, our expenses are exceeding our revenues. We just we're spending down those those balances intentionally so it's it's not a deficit spending position where we're not making up that money um, overall our expenses are going up 1.1 million and that's largely due to tuition costs contract people transportation and purchase services and there were some offsets in our salaries and benefits we we still have a fair number of support staff vacancies so right now we're saving about 760,000 uh, projected savings in that due to those um, we've also because of those vacancies, we've had an increase in some of our contracted services for like occupational and physical therapy. Um, that's driven up those costs. And when we combine that with the increases for some of the higher number of out-of-district placements, both of those hit our tuition line item as far as the tuition expense, so that went up 465000 And then also related to that is the uh, contract people transportation, which we had to add another 700000 to cover those. So that's pretty much in a nutshell, I don't know if anybody has any, any questions about the budget revision. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. But we're in good shape right now, honestly. It's, this is probably one of the be best positions I've seen almost my entire career, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Jeff, could you, I didn't touch on that for a minute, but could you briefly explain, like, um, we've all seen the increase the past month with our whenever real estate. Taxes and that, and I think there's some misinformation that's out there. Um, so, of our part in that, if you could explain that a little bit, it's we, beneficial. We don't really have a part in that. Um, the assessor assessed the properties at 26, 27, 30 percent more than they were two years ago. It's just a function of the real estate market in the area. Honestly, I mean, you don't see too many houses that stay on the market very long these days. Um, I was Honestly, reading an article the other day that said people are keeping their houses so there's not an inventory so it's keeping even though interest rates are going up you're still seeing higher values in the marketplace because people come something comes up people are still outbidding each other to get it um, as far as the district's concerned and what we bring in revenue from real estate taxes we're there's the Hancock amendment so we are we have a calculation that we have to follow by state law as property values go up we roll our rate back and we are able to take growth in some of the growth but it's we're limited by either actual growth five percent or the consumer price index at december 31st and so because consumer price index now is above five percent and so is actual growth we're capped at five percent so we roll our tax levy back as far as it takes to get us so we only get five percent growth now i also want to point out that for many years and you can look at if you actually look at in this book if you under the budget tab the, the budget message tab nope take that back yep it is not a budget message tab. there is a history of our tax levies and our tax le on page one behind the budget message that shows the actual growth in of our in our assessed valuation and then the change in our tax levy so for many a year what you're what, what's not in here is the cpi and so the CPI for many years was 1.5, 1.2, 1.7. So the, as far as inflation was, it was super low, and we weren't seeing a lot of growth in that from that pers perspective. So, and since we get the lesser of one of those three numbers, CPI was normally what we were in in output. So it's kind of nice to see this a little bit. I know inflation's not great on everybody's pocketbook, but as far as our tax levy, I mean, it, it helps us bringing more money to fund
because everybody's costs are going up, including ours, so it's helping fund those increased costs that we're gonna have as well. I mean, that's- What, what are you expecting to roll our levy back? Uh, I did some esti preliminary estimates and it's around 25, 26 cents is the rollback right now, mm -hmm. but that's always subject to change depending on when we get our, um, the Board of Equalization will meet, coming up here we'll get some July numbers, some preliminary numbers, and then we'll get um, around August, we'll get the final numbers after the board meets, and that's when. But there will be a sizable rollback. There will be a sizable in the tax back. levy. Correct. Yes, there will be. When, when will that take place? We set the levy in September. We'll, we should get our final numbers in the end of July, in the middle of August, and then we'll set our levy in September. And that's usually we're required to set it by October <coughs> one, but we, we so we'll bring that to the September board. <coughs> So I, I drafted a memo. I would like to recommend that the district continue with Clifton Larson Allen as the district's independent auditor, auditor for this year. So it'd be the year ending June 30, 2023. Um, we've worked with this firm for many years, been very pleased with their services. Um, they're proposing a fee increase up to 31,000 to complete the audit plus 900, which there are some federal reporting that they have to do behind the scenes that at, after, it, after the audit is completed. Um, I actually contacted several districts that just completed a formal RFP, and I was actually very surprised at the lack of bids that they received. They put it out in the marketplace, and uh, KEB was, they're big in the school districts. Um, but as you can see here, they're all paying more except for Clayton. They got 27000 but they're building in fee increases. So right now, we're in a really good place to be. There's a lot of there are audit firms out there and a lot of them don't do school district business school finance is a little bit of a different animal so um, they have to have some kind of an expertise to do the federal compliance component the transportation compliance component the state and federal there's a lot of compliance that goes into these audits so that's why i think a lot of audit firms choose not to bid on districts um so i i would like to recommend them for 31 9 is it going to be this and i'm I will probably have to take that out to bid next year, but right now I think this is a, a really good place to be. To be honest, they started out at about 41, and I twisted their arm and said, hey, this is a clean audit. We've been with you guys forever. Work with us, and they brought it back down to 31.9, which I'm <coughs> very happy with. So that's my recommendation. Questions, comments? Great. If not, any motion to approve the independent audit recommendations as presented? Next item, um, as you may know, the, our student information system in Missouri, a lot of the districts use um, SIS system as well. Uh, that system is going offline effectively at the end of next year. Um, and so we need to start working on having a system in place to replace that and allow time for our staff to get onboarded with it. JD worked with multiple people and looking at the available options out there um, as are pretty much a majority of districts in the state. And he has a recommendation for you. Okay. Uh, thank you, members of the board. Uh, we uh, have been evaluating alternatives for our student information system since about August of this year. Um, so we've spent a tremendous amount of time reviewing the alternatives that are out there. Um, a little difficult because there's not a lot of alternatives that are available in the state of Missouri that have experience with building um, decent sized systems to work with. So um, we pulled together a committee. Uh, that involves uh, members from just about every department you can think of because our SIS really covers everything that we do from a core infrastructure perspective. So um, when it came down to it, we brought three vendors in to do full day in-person presentations and then we did some follow-up technical presentations from them to dive into the back end, the data security and privacy components, um, how it's going to interact with all of our other systems and how that's going to work. So um, just a tremendous amount of feedback. And I, I will also mention we had 
um, uh, teachers that participated in this as well because they're involved with that daily use of grade level <coughs> things and other things. And we had a number of staff that, that kind of looked at it from that parent perspective in addition um, because we <coughs> understand that our parents are in here quite a bit as well. So um, there's a, a lot of moving components and parts to this, um, but when it comes down to it, uh, we looked at all of the functionality and then compared it with the pricing and uh, it worked out very well that the, the lowest cost bidder was also the one that everyone uh, gave the highest reviews on before we even saw the numbers come back on the pricing. So um, we asked for honest feedback from everybody that was participating and scored each of the vendors based on the feedback from the department that they worked for. So for example, SPED would give us a score, we use that as their component score as part of the solution. That's what you'll see in the bid documentation that I provided in the attachment. So with that in mind, um, we are looking at this from a five-year perspective. Um, it was the easiest way to put apples to apples in terms of cost. Uh, because a lot of the vendors have a different cost in that first year because of implementation and then the, the numbers change a little bit from year to year. So in terms of a five-year total cost, um, we came in with the lowest bid and the best product from Focus School Software. Um, over the course of five years, that would be a total of $1,021,613.84. Um, they will begin a, an implementation for us in the fall. Um, the idea would be that we would get the back-end configuration built, start designing all the, the frameworks that we need for courses um, and how logins are going to occur, get a lot of data starting on transfer. Um, there's just a lot of pieces that we have to get moved over. Um, our goal is to go live with class enrollments in the new system in January of 24. Um, that would allow students to enroll in their new coursework using the new system so that everything's already designed and laid out and ready to start building those, those classes. And then full migration cutover in the, the summer of 2024. So we would go live in the, the fall of 24 on the new system. Um, just as a comparison, I also threw in there, um, our current cost with Tyler is 206,822. So we are right in the same ballpark, even though we're new and moving to a new system. Um, some benefits I will tell you, newer system also means we get some newer features. So. We really felt comfortable that the training was fantastic, the ease of use and interface was really good. Um, it's also going to be cloud hosted, so we don't have to worry about backups and servers here operating it. Um, and we did quite a bit of work on making sure that that data privacy and security component all looks fantastic. So um, we feel very comfortable in recommending that this is the best solution for us to move forward with. How different is this going to look for parents trying to kind of manage how the kids are doing with assignments? Yeah, there's, there's obviously going to be a difference. Um, every system we looked at was quite a bit different. Um, I think the biggest thing with this is it's going to be a much more modern interface, and that's something that our current provider hasn't updated their interface in years. I mean, just a long time. And so there will be a change, and we're going to be providing training for our parents, for our students, for our staff, everyone involved. I think the com core components are going to be very much the same, though. You're going to be looking for grades, and you're going to see the grade book for your kids and the classes that they're in. Um, you're going to see any notes that are in the system around, you know, things that are due, all that kind of stuff is all going to be inside of there. Um, so I think from that component, it's going to be very good. The other piece is the mobile app that's available with this is there's a mobile app, right? It's a, it's a fully functional mobile app that really shows everything that we want our parents to be able to see and participate in. <coughs> Any other questions? Can I help with? With that, I need a motion to approve the Focus School software as presented before you. Second. Second. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 Salary agreement. We've completed those negotiations um, with our representative group, and Henry's going to walk us through the particulars. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, you have in your board packet a memo from me uh, outlining the uh, recommendation for computer tech salary.
agreement, which includes a cross-board increase of a dollar an hour plus 7.1%. Uh, that is for one year, the 23-2024 school year. And uh, that agreement was uh, ratified with 100% approval by our computer technicians. Uh, we would recommend that you approve this so that we can get going on our letters of employment and uh, <coughs> send those out to the staff. Yeah, we just consistent with our policy. Uh, we've had several requests from um, club sponsors and coaches for the, our task force to meet and review point allocations and or possibly consider additional clubs. Um, our policy outlines a mechanism for that process to take place. And uh, we have a task force that hears those requests. It's comprised of four members from the Teachers Association and our activities coordinators. And um, I chair that uh, committee. Um, in order to hear those requests, the first step is just to get permission from the board to meet. And any uh, recommendations for changes will be brought back to the board for a subsequent um, consideration and potential approval. So this is just an ask for us to meet. We would do that uh, in the first week of June, potentially, and then bring back any recommendations for changes to you at a subsequent board meeting. Any questions? I do have a question. For this meeting, these... Uh items that you have listed are those the only things you'd be allowed to talk about in this meeting so typically they would there's some preparation that the coaches and sponsors who are requesting this this is initiated by the individual coaches and sponsors okay. um, and they have prepared um, or would be preparing um, you know um, a, a case if you will such that um, outlines why they think their sport their club whatever is um, worthy of a point increase most that's a point increase. So um, our task force and subsequently the board approves the um, number of points that's assigned to any particular activity. And then those point, each point is worth a dollar value. That dollar value goes through our teacher negotiation process for, um, and that, that information would be included in any application <coughs> for, for increase. Um, but that point value, is, that's a $141 a point for next year. Motion to approve the request for the extracurricular topic. <coughs> Mr. Holmes, second. Mr. George, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Next item, there's a review or request to adjust the memorandum of understanding of our crisis counselors. Yeah, we have um, an agreement with our crisis counselors and social workers, and um, in talking with uh, John Schulte and Melissa Tishy, our coordinator of social emotional support services. Um, we have um, stumbled upon, as, as the board has approved, the hiring of some additional uh, resources in regards to mental health supports that we had some barriers due to the title, titling of those positions. And so um, we are, we would like to reclassify, rename that, that position from crisis counselor and social worker to mental health professional streamline those two, what are now separate job descriptions, make it one job description, a mental health professional, a little more of a broader, all-encompassing um, set of requirements. It'll just, just give us more flexibility in, in hiring um, staff. It is name change only. Um, it's a little bit of a technical maneuver because this group is originally organized with the State Board of Mediation under crisis counselor and social worker. So in order for us to change that with the State Board of Mediation, we have to get this agreement signed. The association has already signed off on it, as you see in your packet. Um, so we would just ask the board to approve that MOU that is included in your packet. Um, upon approval, then we would um, file a petition with the State Board of Mediation to clarify that unit to mental health professionals. And then next time we negotiate language, we clean all that up. So we'd come through and and update all the language to mental health professional, get rid of crisis counselor, social worker. Um, it's a title change only. Uh, so we recommend you approve that. This is effective the next school year? This would be effective next school year. Yeah. Does it change any of the qualifications or 
So what, what we would have for um, qualifications for the mental health professionals would be a master's in social work, which we already have for our social worker position and um, <clears throat> crisis counselor, a master's degree in professional counseling, psychology, or social work, and preferred that they are licensed in the state of Missouri under several different accrediting agencies <coughs> would be the requirements for the mental health I think one of them. Yep. This is a little broader the array. Right. Yep. Much more mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Mars. Uh, North Middle School, when that uh, construction, the city has requested an easement on the south side of the property, kind of by the football or the baseball fields. They want a 10 foot easement to make like a walking path. The city's trying to create those walking paths. So they're asking for an easement on our property to have that. And we accommodated that with our construction to add more concrete for our parking. So um, it's kind of just a real simple easement for them. Eventually. Yeah, wherever they decide to take that. But yes. Questions? Comments? I guess the only question I have, and I, I guess you can answer it, but it is that is there any legal things about that if they're walking on a no fouling path and then it goes through our property? But the easement, I guess, gives it to them. So now Correct. I'm going to answer my own question. Yes. <laughs> no, that's what an easement is. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to think it out loud. Yeah, that's right. That's Good right. Thank you. I'm like, there we go. <laughs> that's why I'm no. glad you asked before me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a motion to approve the North Middle School easement? No, I think we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm good. Mr. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then the last item on new business, Lisa, asked for a recommendation for a super easement at West Middle. Yes, at West Middle School there is a property being developed. Um, I guess it's to the south east of east. our property. Yeah. So, yep, of our property right off of Highway K. But they need to get a uh, sanitary line through there. So they're asking for an easement between our property and the golf course. So um, they're asking for that easement. And then I'm assuming once they get it done and all the construction's over, they have the um, flexibility to then grant it to the utilities so that they can maintain it. So that's what that easement is for. Are they for sure going in there? The scrubbles? Or I think it's Scrubbles. Yeah, Scrubbles and There was another sign up thing for sale again. What? Express Cars. Express Car Wash. You can drive. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 the audience coming out tonight it was really it was really cool to see all those uh the uh, the academic all state excellence that our district has um we've got a bunch of individuals that have some very bright futures and i commend them on their uh on their achievements um thank you i wanted to say uh thank you to everyone who came and shared your stories um we are certainly listening to you 
Uh, thank you for your sharing your concerns about the Kiki Minutes as well uh, with the elementary schools. Love, love, love hearing about the robotics team, and I love getting those emails with the links and the pictures. Those, some of those robots look scary. You guys should really check them out. Um, congratulations to those incredible students. There, I tried to count. I think there were like 15. There were a lot of them. There were. That's absolutely amazing. And thank you to all of those, all the staff members that were involved in all those recommendations. I am a person who loves details, and there were a lot of details in there, so I really appreciated that work that went into that, and same with the finance, uh, everything, so thank you. Thank you, Mary. Yes, I, I agree with all of that, by the way, so I'll just second all of that. I appreciate the comments as well. Um, also, what made me think about it, uh, setting that June meeting, that special meeting, would it be possible maybe in June or July regular meeting um, if we could look forward and find, because I know we're going to be in the same shape for January, February, and April next year that we were this year, where we're going to have to move them off the holiday. Yeah. If we could do them all at once before the year, then it's a lot easier for planning for everybody. So, mm -hmm. Perfect. Probably already had that done. Oh, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, <didn't bother. laughs> I was trying to make up for these minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody had a great Mother's Day yesterday. That was a good milestone, did you? All right. Uh, kudos to all our teachers. Uh, it was teacher appreciation this week. If uh, you guys aren't putting on all these hard uh, hours, you can't make this uh, all work. Thanks for all your hard work. Uh, and to piggyback off that, thanks for all the hard work on the curriculum for the math and the ELA. You can tell that a lot of hours went into that, and that's not uh, easy, given at that time. Uh, <clears throat> saw a lot of talent with the academic all-stars. I'm glad they came in. That was neat. And uh, go robotics team. <laughs> yeah, just the third and fourth everything about the congratulations. Thanks for all the hard work for the curriculum, and, and as always, you folks over there with. Uh, you know, finance and curriculum and everything. Um, just one thing to add, thank you for coming out tonight to, to speak about the behaviors and the issues we're having at, at certain places. Um, Zumwalt has always done a good job with discipline. We always do a good job of trying to meet kids' needs. But it's a challenge right now. It really is. And I think by coming out and talking and having these dialogues. The only way we're gonna do this is together. You know, some people believe it goes from the top down. Well, I think it goes top down, but I think it's gotta come back up. We gotta support all the way down, we gotta support all the way up, and that includes parents, kids, teachers, building administrators, district administrators, and us as a board. Um, it is a challenge, and uh, you know, these kids, sometimes we're limited by certain <coughs> requirements that we have to meet. But that doesn't mean we don't still have our expectations. And, and I think we need to continue to be strong. We need to continue to, to be firm and guide these students while also <coughs> supporting them. So please keep up the communication. Talk, talk with your building administrators because that does filter up. And we want to provide assistance. So thank you for coming out, I appreciate it. Nothing really left. <laughs> so I'm just gonna say I concur with all of my colleagues and all their their kind of their you know, comments. And obviously the commenters, the ones that keep showing up, I think that's phenomenal because a lot of stuff we don't hear about. So sometimes that's the first year about those things. Obviously we've heard it in things going on the South High, but you know it's it definitely it uh, it, it just it, it just brings it more relevant to us when you when it's people coming up talking to us and, and trust and believe we can hear the passion in your voice we can hear it we understand it we get it so you know we all feel it up here so don't think it, it was dismissed or it just went over our heads we understand and we appreciate that and that's that and that's for all the teachers in the district we want to do everything we can to support you and make sure you feel supported um, but, but like john said communication is vital and some things get past us and you know we apologize about that, but we really try to address everything that ever comes across our desk that, that we're text, we see on, on social media, emails, etc. So, um, 
you know, I just want all the teachers to know we do support you, we hear you, We're, it's all a work in progress. You know, it's laws are changing, policies are changing, things are changing, we're just trying to keep up and put you all in position to, to do, you know, the best job you can do. Um, outside of that, district administration, thank you so much. You all do a phenomenal job every time. Um, kudos to the academic all-star that thinks that's phenomenal. It says so much about our district to have so many of those kids here. Um, hey, next next month, I look forward to seeing everybody here, hopefully even more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. I agree with everything you guys said. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on um, what you were talking about, Mr. Christopher. Um, it's really hard at times when we can't respond back to you. Um, and especially, I want you all to know that we're all very aware of things that are going on. Our administration is very aware of what's going on. Um, it takes a process, right? And you have to look at those processes and say, is this working? And it's not. So what do we need to do to make it better? And with that, we're all, I can tell you 100% who have these discussions and we're working on what will work and what needs to change. So stay with us and keep giving us that feedback. Um, because there are changes coming that we all think are going to be for the better and help not just our kids, you know, because times have changed a lot and we need to change with that, but we also need to help all the kids in the whole picture. So um, I just wanted to share that with all of you because sometimes it's hard when we can't just talk right back and tell you that or it seems like something isn't going on or we're not taking care of it, but we definitely are. And, and this team up here and here, non-stop working on it and it's intertwined with our CSET plan and everybody that's been involved with that it's we're all very aware and we're all concerned and we all want to make it better because we're all parents former graduates and we all love the district so all right with that I need a motion to go into closed session in accordance with RMS 1621 to discuss the approval of minutes from the April 21st closed session hiring crime promotion personnel legal matters and student personnel matters. Mr. Helms, second, Mr. Pratt, roll call, Mr. Pratt. Yes. We are now back in an open session. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Mr. Helms, second. Mr. George.